we will read scripture from the book of Exodus, beginning with the first chapter, verse 8. Hear now these words. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase, and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramesses, for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shipra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every boy that is born to the Hebrews you shall grow, throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God within us, for the word of God among us, thanks be to God. Amen. John Robert Lewis was born near Troy, Alabama on February 21st, 1940, in a rural portion of Alabama. His parents, Willie May and Eddie Lewis, were sharecroppers. He was the third of ten children. John Lewis would become one of the 13 original freedom writers, the group of black and white activists who challenged the practice of segregated seating on interstate buses. At age 23, he was elected chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, due in part to his notoriety as a committed pursuer of peaceful reconciliation. He had been arrested 24 times by the time he was 23 for his nonviolent protest. That same year, in 1963, Lewis helped to organize the March on Washington, and he provided the speech immediately before Dr. King's iconic I Have a Dream speech at that event. Lewis's speech had to be revised last minute as some in the leadership believed he was too harsh with the Kennedy administration for not protecting Southern black students from racial violence. John Lewis would go on to become a voting rights organizer a member of the Carter administration, an Atlanta City Council member, and of course, a 17-term U.S. representative. But what you may not know is that it was John Lewis's faith that inspired his activism and his work in the public sphere. He was an ordained Baptist minister before he was ever a freedom writer. In fact, his family tells stories of when he was even five years old and preaching to the chickens at the family farm. Towards the end of his life, John Lewis famously said this to a group gathered, do not get lost in a sea of despair. Be hopeful, be optimistic. Our struggle is not the struggle of a day, a week, a month, or a year. It is the struggle of a lifetime. Never, ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. This month, in the spirit of John Lewis, and as a people of faith who are called to preach to chickens, make some noise and get in some good trouble, let's talk about what that looks like in Scripture. 
how the stories of rule breakers and good troublemakers in the Bible might inform the lives that we lead, not just for a day or a week or a month, but for our entire lives. Now, the story that we just heard read to us from the book of Exodus, it begins with a statement that is a blink and you'll miss it kind of statement. What I mean by that is you can read it and sort of move on, but it contains so much more power and meaning than we give it credit for at first glance. It says this, now a new king arose over Egypt. Now a new king arose over Egypt. Why does that matter? Because if you were reading this, especially in the day of the Israelites, you would know from the very beginning of this story that this is a story told by Israelites and not by Egyptians. Because Egypt didn't have a king. No, the Egyptians had a pharaoh. Everybody had kings. Kings were a dime a dozen. The Egyptians had a pharaoh. That meant uh, a member of the household. It was thought that the pharaoh was the son of the sun god Ra, God-man here on earth to lord over the mightiest nation the world had ever seen, the pharaoh, not a king. This is a reminder that Exodus is less a historical narrative and more a theological narrative. What I mean by that is it's more of a story of who we are in the midst of God's story. And it's less about the dates and times and places that we'll be quizzed on at the pop quiz tomorrow morning. The story begins with the, scr- with the author screaming for all who have ears to hear. This is the story of when a king with a little K tries to challenge the Lord with a capital L to eliminate all of God's people, to wage war against God. And when hearing the story for the first time, you can almost hear the author asking the question, don't you think you know how the story's going to end? When this king with a little K rules over Egypt? Of course, this is not to take away from the horror exhibited in this first chapter The Israelites begin chapter 1 right where they picked up after the end of Genesis, celebrated as the offspring of Joseph. Joseph, who was a tremendous leader. Joseph, who was second in command to the former Pharaoh. And then in 22 short verses, the Hebrew people are enslaved and then brutalized and then subject to attempted genocide. But... This is a story told with titles rightly assigned. And so even in the midst of incredible grief, there is hope. Hope. If Pharaoh was telling this story, it would be a very different story indeed. It would be told very differently. That light of hope would be incredibly dim, if not even non-existence. But here, Pharaoh is just a king. And not just a king, but a king with a little k. The Israelites know whose story this really is. It's God's story, and it's theirs to share with God. And so even in this opening sentence, the author creates questions that rise up within me. Who needs a title change in your life? Am I living in God's story, or am I living in someone else's? Does our story... I'm a recovering cynic. Anybody else in the chat a recovering cynic? Go ahead and raise your hand or type, that's me. Person watching with. I'm a recovering cynic. All too easily I can fall into hopelessness. And I know that frequently that's because I have let my story be framed by a pharaoh in my life who is actually a king with a little k. Can I reclaim my place within God's story? Because even in the moments when hopelessness tries to take hold, we can remember how God's story ends. We know how Exodus ends. It ends with liberation. We know how God's story ends. John Lewis knows how God's story ends. He knew how it ends. It's how he could face the life of evil of Jim Crow in the South and to see that his was a lifetime of work. Not a day, not a week, or even a month or a year. Still, though, the story in verses 8 through 14 is incredibly bleak. This king seems hell-bent on grinding the Israelites down like the wheat ground down into the mud to make the bricks for his personal monuments. And so in this story called Exodus, whose mere name informs us of God's great plans of rebellion, whom will God choose to offer the first monumental moment of resistance? Shipra, 
and Puah. Shifra and Puah, midwives of unknown origin, women without families of their own, little higher than slaves in the social order, and yet tasked with this sacred work of holding the blood, sweat, and tears of birthing moms and their babies. Did you know that 93 women speak in the Old Testament? Only 93 women speak in the Old Testament. Of those, only 49 are named. Two of them are Shifra and Pua. So don't you dare rush on to chapter 2 and sweet little baby Moses, no. These women deserve our attention and are worthy of our emulation this Sunday. Now I've heard more than one version of this sermon where a pastor, a dude, will say something along the lines of, can you believe, can you believe that God would use these two women, disdain intended, these midwives, to make a way for Moses in the world. Lord, let's drop the patriarchy, please. Can you believe it, brother pastor? Yes, we can believe it. Of course we can believe it. The fact that the king thought so little of them is part of why they were so potently powerful. Will we make the same mistake as the king? But it goes even further than that. Of course, we need our mothers and our midwives to save us. The king was attacking birth and baby boys. And should the men be the ardent protectors of the womb and womanhood? The men who are busy making bricks for the Pharaoh. I wonder if we can hear the echoes of Exodus today. We serve a God who seeks to actively empower every single person. Let us not diminish that power in an effort to fit God's purposes neatly and tidily within our own. God did not choose Shifra and Pua and the Hebrew women to lead the resistance because it was just so darn sneaky, but because they possessed the courage and the strength and the stomach to take the first faithful step while the men were busy making bricks. We've had confirmation class meeting for a few weeks now out in our prayer garden here at the church. If you don't know, confirmation is the year when our kids begin to really wrestle with their own personal faith, and the idea is that they take a year to uh, try to make that faith their own, so they can make a decision on their own about their own faith and begin to build that work. And it, of course, it's a lifetime of work, but it's an important year in the life of our kids, and it's an important year of questions. Really deep, meaningful questions will arise. And I heard that one of our students uh, last week, somehow the conversation turned towards the Holocaust, and, and they asked this deep, profound question, where was God in that season of suffering? Where was God in that time of such abundant evil? Where was God? That's a good question. We ask really good questions here at Arapaho. Our kids ask really good questions here. Scholars ask the same question about this first chapter in Exodus. Where was God in all this suffering and in, in, in this attempted genocide? Where was God? You know, some have noted that God's so absent except for when God makes the Israelites multiply, which ironically makes their suffering even worse. Where is God? I believe that God expresses God's power through the faithful resistance of Shifra and Pua and every Hebrew woman who refused to let some king with a little K threaten them or their bodies or their lives or the future of their people. Where is God in this story? She is in their resistance. And it's the way that they resist, the brand of resistance that Shifra and Pua offer, that God offers through them that I find especially inspiring this Sunday. The scripture tells us that not only did Shifra and Pua ignore the command of the king, it specifically says that they let the boys live. Quote, they let the boys live. Again, blink and you'll miss it. In the Midrash, the Midrash is a collection of ancient commentary from ancient rabbis. The Midrash has this assertion that because the scripture specifically mentions this giving of life, that Shifra and Pua didn't simply act against or prevent the murder of the boys that they delivered. They actively aided in the health and well-being and the births of everyone in their area. The Midrash imagines Shifra and Pua running from place to place, collecting food and water for the women and mothers and children who were the poorest among them. It's not just a resistance against the king's decree, but rather it's a resistance for the lives of the Hebrew people. 
when the king calls Shifra and Pua to account, they use his own bias against him, subverting his own expectations. They refer to the Hebrew women as vigorous. The word they use there has a connotation of animalistic. Animalistic. The king in his genocidal rage has come to view the Hebrew people as subhuman. And Shifra and Pua are leveraging this bias against him. They are, as Jesus would say, wise as serpents. Subversive in their understanding of the evil at play and all the more powerful in the good they seek to bring. Their resistance leads the king to order every boy thrown into the Nile. And in the next chapter, in chapter 2, one boy named Moses will be placed in the Nile as a result. As people called, uh, or if people of faith called to make good trouble in our own lives, let's not miss the fact that Shifra and Pua, while successful in their own subversive efforts, do not solve every problem at hand. It doesn't get fixed in a day, or a week, or a single act. Their faithfulness, however, their faithfulness does create a path for God to continue what will become a monumental moment in the story of God with us. Shifra and Pua's story ultimately is not simply about what they accomplished or what they completed, but rather what they started. The monumental moments in God's story with us so often begin with an act of faithful subversion in the name of love. Can we name the elephant in the room this week, my friends? As we consider all that Shifra and Pua are teaching us this Sunday, this All Saints Sunday, can we also acknowledge the week that is before us? This week is going to be a bumpy ride in the midst of a very challenging year. We may or may not know the results of the election by this time next week. Results could be contested in the courts for months. Tensions are already high and continue to rise. Ammunition is out of stock in retailers as 2020 has seen a surge in gun and ammunition sales. Shops and stores in New York City have begun to board their windows out of fear of what may take place. We know that our country has long been sin sick with the love of violence and we just recorded our highest one day total of COVID tests positive with Texas leading the way. Do you feel the tension rising in your own chest as I do in mine? Tuesday could change a lot, and Tuesday is important. I pray that you vote. I pray you raise your voice. I pray that you express yourself in the public sphere as one deeply devoted to a God of justice and of mercy. But my friends, remember John Lewis. This is not a day or a week or a month-long work that we have before us. Just because your preferred candidate may win or may lose does not mean that your work is done. We are called to be agents of life, agents of justice, agents of grace and of mercy and of love, not for a day, not for a season, but for a lifetime. In a week where kings with very little K's will try to frame the narrative where fear and death will seek to cast out all and any hope, can we call upon Shifra and on Pua on this All Saints Sunday to lead us down a different, more faithful path. Shifra and Pua, who stared evil in the eye and did not blink. Who were not just against the Pharaoh's campaign of death, but were passionately for an abundance of life. Who refused to have themselves or their story be defined by a king with a little K, whose names are recorded remembered and exalted in the story of God, whose faithful resistance made space for God's gracious spirit to do her work, whose greatest achievement was not what they completed, but rather what they started. What could we start today? Or this week? Or this month? What could we do in support of the kingdom of God and in defiance of kings with little k's. How could our faithfulness, our good trouble in the name of God, create space for God to do her good work in our world? In a world riddled with fear and death and lorded by kings with very little k's, be a Shifra and a Pua.
Let the holy midwives lead you in a different way of living, a way of faith, a way of life, a way of courage, a good trouble kind of life. Amen.